this morning Smile with the rising sun Three little birds Fits by my doorstep Singing sweet songs Of melodies pure and true Saying This is my message to you I 
this I want me say A sweet, sweet chronics, you fi give them, give them The one drop beat, pan a rhythm, rhythm I you give them bob with a different step in I you give them bolt, nobody can run left him Boy, but see ya Them must see things say you out of ideas You give them art and sweet literature You go make the world see the better picture uh-huh. I said no worry yourself, mama Chronics is here to your help, mama hey, I said no worry yourself, mommy uh-huh. One thing me I beg you do And I said smile, yeah, smile, papa Smile for me, Jamaica And I said smile, girl, yeah, smile Sorry about the, the little interruption there, we were just making sure the music was okay. And then should we start to get everybody in? Okay, so if I could kindly ask please. Thank you. 
You are ready, please make your way towards myself. Now, gentlemen, turn to me, come to me, Thank you, all bearers. If you could just keep making your way towards me, please. Bearers, if you could just line up now and keep coming down until I tell you when to stop, please, to make sure you're not too far over. Perfect there. And then all together, please, nice and slowly, just go down.
on this sad day. God is with us. We've come to remember Joseph Clifford Brown, known as Peter. Here we will mourn him leaving us and celebrate his life. Honour his life and death. Commend him to God's protection and peace and comfort each other. Would you like to sit? And so we pray. Gracious God, at this moment, as we come face to face with death and our own mortality, come close to us with your love. Travel with us into this serious moment and open our hearts to each other. We ask it in the name of Jesus Christ, who faced his own death and the death of a friend. Amen. A reading from Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So as we begin to reflect, we'll sing the hymn that you'll find in your order of service. Hear my cry, O Lord, please stand as you're able.
we did a good job of singing that. Nobody would doubt that you could sing that hymn. Would you like to be seated as I invite Michael and Hyacinth and Hayden and Melissa to give Peter's eulogy? Good afternoon, everybody. Today we remember, honor, and celebrate the life of Joseph Clifford Brown, AKA Peter. Everyone knows him by this name. Peter was a man of grace, great courage, creative, easygoing, yet rich with immense dignity and love. Peter was born in Dudley on the 29th of April, 1960. He was the second of five siblings. In 1962, Peter and his siblings were taken to Jamaica, where we were all raised by our late grandparents, Uriah and Olive Clark, in the parish of St. Anne. They were farmers. Peter had a fairly happy childhood, though we were made to work very hard in the farms from a very young age, even missing schools to help out. In 1971, age 11, our parents, Ernell and Rainis Brown, came back to Jamaica, where they took over a parental role for Peter and his older sibling. Our dad was also a farmer. Helping out in the farm continues, as well as missing schools. He hated it. For the benefit of those who do not know, helping out in the farms included, but not limited to, weeding the grasses, plowing the land, planting peas, corn, potatoes, yam, cutting yam stick in the forest. He did not like it to say the least but he was humble and willing to get on with it. He didn't have a choice, really. <laughs> Peter went to retirement school from he was age six years old to eight, and then went on school up to the age of 15. So his, ed his education was limited because of the farming. Even in recent times, as long as it were, he complained about back pains and blame it at, at the hard work he used to do in the farming. <laughs> Peter was a humble child growing up and has been throughout the end, very compliant. Peter was known for, from a very young age to being able to turn his hands in the kitchen. For the benefit of who don't know what that means, it means he could cook. <laughs> In 1974, our mother went to America for a year. Peter would have been 14 years old, yet he was given the responsibility to cook for the rest of the family. He loves it. And up till the end, he still loves cooking. His wife will have more to say about that. He was a chef in his own rights from a tender age. After finishing school age 15, Peter was made to help his dad, uh, our dad, to do the farming full time. Again, he hated it, but was compliant. After two years of it, he had decided he had enough, and he left to go to Kingston to find work. He soon found out that life were more difficult in Kingston, such that four people sharing a room with one bed, food was scarce, so he was hungry most of the times, and the echoing of gunshots around him. As difficult and dangerous, dangerous as it were, he still refused to come back home 
because he hated the farming that awaits him. Mamanda became aware of the danger he was in, so they decided to send him back to England. Peter left Jamaica for England in August 1978. Can't remember the exact date, but it was August 1978, age 18 years old, where he started a new chapter. Peter became a welder by trade. He worked from, for one employer for over 10 years and then became self-employed. He made my first jerk pan. Over to Ascent. Welcome family and friends. And thank you for all your love and your support and encouragement, your flowers, your gifts that you sent to the family. Thank you very much. And also thank you for the space I needed just to grieve with the family. So thank you all. Joseph Clifford Brown, known as Peter. Mine hobby. Quiet man. A very private man. A happy man. A quietly funny man in his own way. A stubborn man. <laughs> Gifted as a welder. Didn't like to be employed, so he went out on his own. He was an excellent family man, and that's what he prized him. He was always calm, which was also annoying for me. He was humble, shy, patient, gentle, uncomplicated, total opposite to me. I think that's why we gelled, and obviously at times they were going to have areas of improvements usually for Peter. He had strong family values, which he installed um, in our family. I met him at FCF nightclub in Hansworth. <laughs> Who said good things don't come from FCF, right? <laughs> He came with his Dudley posse, Ashley, Roger, Robert, and Lance. And he stared for hours at me across the room. And you, you know when they, you could feel the eyes on you. I just know he was around following me, yeah? And it was his eyes, his eyes, that pitiful eyes, you know, um, that, yeah, the brown eyes that draw me. And I could see him going around the room, and I really couldn't say no to him. It meant so much of an effort to make sure he was noticed. So I had, we had a dance. Um, it was Donna. She's always in the midst of wrong things, you know, Donna. Um, that we, he walked us outside the nightclub, and he asked for my number, and he gave me my number. Well, I wasn't going to give him my number. But I was selling a blue 104 Peugeot at the time, 105 Peugeot, a little old hatchback thing. And in those days, you didn't have auto traders. So we had to put a for sale sign and your telephone number on it. Well, I couldn't hide, couldn't, I couldn't give him a false number because my number was at the back of the car. It was surprising that the very next day, so we met on the Friday, the very next day, I saw him on Soho Road. So it was like a second opportunity to say hi and hello, and his big smile, putit. He was a very good father, and those traits were very important to me and he excelled in that tremendously. Peter is the jerk king, despite what Hector says, or Monica. 
despite what he did. He was the jerk king for us. And everybody gathered because of his cooking. Oh, this is a joke because he wouldn't let me in the kitchen. Not that I wanted to go anyway, but he, he wouldn't let me in the kitchen. He always wanted to do the cooking. That was his way of showing his love and appreciation. And he drew the family together by his cooking. But it didn't just stay at friends, it was extended to family as well, friends and family. On many occasions, Peter was the centre of the family gathering with his cooking, but he liked to stay quietly in the background, didn't want to be in the forefront. He used to listen to the girls talking. He used to be interested in the many conversations, but he would listen, he would not normally get involved. He taught Hayden how to cook. Skip me and Melissa, you know. He taught Hayden how to cook because of the strong values he felt uh, a man needed for his family. That's how he saw it, so he wanted Hayden to be raised the same. And he was the only one that had the, the jerk seasoning, the recipe for the jerk seasoning. He made many drum pans for many of our friends and family. And um, because Melissa was so extra, every birthday... He had to get the pan out and the many parties. And he was always, sure, it's only food. Let's share and bring everybody together. And that was his way, that was his love language. Peter was from St. Anna's, Mike, he just said, Jamaican. And he was taught to grow vegetables, herbs. We've got apple trees, we've got pear trees, we've got thyme, we've got scallion in our garden. He loved being outside. He took his responsibility as a family man seriously. And that stayed with him right to the end of his life. He'd always used to say to me, when you're cooking, make sure you cook with love, you know. And many Sundays, and on many, every Sunday, we gathered as a family at home. And he would make, he would do the seasoning part, season up the meat, and leave the rest for me to do. But, you know, I had to sit in that kitchen and watch that pot. Because if you burnt it, you would never hear the last of it. I think I did that one too many times. The, the, the one uh, episode we can remember, which stays with me because I was given a little bit of privilege, was the rice and peas. And later on in, in, in the years, what happened was, I think he spoiled the rice and peas um, for a couple of Sundays, and we never let him rest. So we gave him grief over it. And then he turned it over to me, you do it then. So I had the privilege then of doing the rice and peas, and he would do the rest. Peter put his family first. I can't say that enough. He put his family first. And we hold many memories of Tower Hill. Kirk and Maureen, Mikey, dances in the living room. Geary. And he loved that. He was a man to stay home, have his little roast, his, his cooking, drink, have a drink, and feel nice in the house, as he called it. We nickname Hayden Golden Child because he gave him privileges. The boy could perform, and I think that went through his many lives, like his many days, and he, he just wanted Hayden. I think it was Jermaine, Jermaine and, and Melissa used to tease him a lot. So he was very protective over him. He was a special man. And his love for Jamaica was immense. The love for his family, Mrs. Brown, your son loved you. 
very much. It was immense. He was a simple man, and I hope the funeral or his celebration reflects that. He wasn't for any loud extravagance. He was calm and quiet. He certainly didn't want any tears. If you cried or showed your emotion, he would exit out the room. I think that's as much as I'm gonna go with because I don't wanna upset Pete by getting all emotional. I'll let the kids give you another version of him. Afternoon, everybody. So, Dad used to take me to football every Saturday, every Sunday. And um, I, I, he's very protected of me. And I remember um, in, in the holidays, there was like a holiday club. And I used to spend the six weeks playing football in Hansworth Wood. Hansworth Wood. Um, and I didn't like to lose. So when I we used to play football, we used to be grouped off, and they'd normally put the, the better players to get, like, separate them to make it more fair. I was one of the better players. However, I was always on the losing team. So I would tell my dad, I don't know why they keep putting me on this rubbish team. The next time I went back to training, I was in the winning team. My dad was very protective of me. He used to love wrestling. And when we used to live in Tower Hill, in Great Bar, he used to perform some of the moves on us. <laughs> Especially my mum. <laughs> he used to love the rock bottom. He used to love the DDT. But my mum used to get the choke slam. <laughs> that was his signature move. My dad was a proper wind-up merchant as well, especially to the grandkids. He, with me and Melissa, he used to crack our fingers when we were young. It was irritating. <laughs> when I used to go to school in Great Bar at Dorrington, he used to give me a pound every single day, which was a lot back then. And we used to get a pick and mix, and me and my sister used to share that. Dad was a great man. You couldn't fault him as a father. From the outside, it appeared that my mum was the driver in the relationship. My dad was, was to support her, to allow her to achieve what she could. Dad gave the family stability, honesty. He was a man of many words, but when he spoke, you heard. Me and Melissa grew up in a well-balanced and beautiful home. Melissa had two dads, her biological dad, and Peter. Peter, my dad, I love Melissa unconditionally. We were set up to be strong, responsible adults, and we raised our children the same way. Dad's standards are embedded in the family right now. is very protective of us. Melissa's friends used to come over every weekend as, as he didn't want her to go out and sleep over us. My friends would leave school or college 
on a Friday and not return back home till Sunday. The house was flooded with friends. We'd have bacon, sausage, egg, every morning. And on a Friday, he might let us have a Chinese. <laughs> every single Sunday for 15 years, since my mom's mother, so my grandmother, since she passed, there was Sunday lunch for all the family. Even if the members were on holiday, they would FaceTime in to be part of it. The music was always on, reggae, gospel, and then back onto reggae. He always had the sound system, even if it didn't fit with mum's decor. <laughs> Dad was the happiest when family was around. He had a very tight-knit family. Melissa living next door, and me just living around the corner. Every birthday, Christmas, Father's Day were big celebrations, but he would never open his presents in front of the family. He'd always say, nobody buy me nothing, but we always did. <coughs> it was always about creating memories. Christmas was leg legendary. Everyone staying over, putting on music, everyone up dancing. He was, when everyone was dancing, he was with the family. Dad wasn't the biggest dancer, but his foot would move. He had a signature nod. <clears throat> he had a magnetic field towards children. They were drawn to him. On Wednesdays, the grandchildren would be collected, and they know they'd be getting fried chicken and fried dumpling after school. Tia was his only granddaughter. She melted him with love and kisses and she was always on his lap. That's it. Good afternoon, everybody. So, the, the third and fourth and final part. So, Dad's favorite place in the entire world was Jamaica. It was his home. And as we enjoyed many family holidays there, it became all of our favorite place. In Jamaica, he was so happy. He was a different man in Jamaica. He took charge. <laughs> now, if you're in England and you know Peter and Haya, you know, Sehaya is boss. <laughs> She's the matron, also known as matron. But if you're in Jamaica and you know Peter and Haya, and I saw it go, <laughs> Peter run things, <laughs> and didn't we know it? He was a, he even walked different in back strong. <laughs> he was so proud to show us off, and we managed to visit all the places that he grew up in plenty times and each time we went we were greeted with the same love from his family and his friends that was a testament to him as a man the respect that he had as a man it encompassed and we felt it as we went out there it was all family he loved Jamaica so much that on the 30th of July 2005 he married my mum it was a lovely intimate occasion with family and close friends and while we know that Peter was a smiler, that day you could count every teeth in our head. <laughs> he would have regular FaceTime calls or Zoom calls with his family from Jamaica, America, London, all over and he would be on the phone for hours and for a man that didn't really say too much, I don't know what he was talking about all that time. But when he was finished, he would be so happy and elated. And he would then update mom with such enthusiasm. He just loved his family. Now, we know that he, we've said he's pro was protective if there was ever any trouble. 
Peter's way of dealing with things was very direct. No lanting, it get resolved quick. So me, Mum and Hayden were very selective with any problems that we took to him. Most of the time we would tell him after it's been resolved because as humble as he was, you see that Taurus temper, it was real. You push him out, disrespect him or his family and you know about it. He was a very straight talking man, no filter. And as a Jamaican man, he did not mix his words, much to the delight of me, Mum and Hayden, who thought he was hilarious. The funniest man who didn't know he was funny. Even when he didn't mean to be funny, he was funny. And it made us laugh harder. But you see, when he's serious and we start laugh, we have to come out the room. We couldn't make eye contact with each other because that just makes situations worse. We'd come out the room and find a pillow or a cushion and go laugh into that because it, as much as he liked the joke, you couldn't laugh after him. <laughs> oh gosh. He used to cuss us when he'd catch me. Oh no, laugh after everything. I know everything for laugh after. Um, and you know when you're holding in your laugh, when you have to try holding your laugh and it's inappropriate and it makes tears come out your eye. That was every situation with us. We had such an enjoyable and loving family. Only three, four are we, but we had an absolute blessing growing up. The only people, the only people I know who could laugh after him and he would take it was Donna and Tyler, the mischievous duo. Only them get away with it. But you see, when him find a joke, oh gosh, he would run the joke over and over and over and over and laugh like it was the first time he heard it. He was a balance of serious and fun. And like Hayden said, he was a wind up merchant, especially for the kids. His friends, if I look at it, tended to be more talkative and louder than him. He was the quiet one in the bunch. So that means say, he liked to have the noise around him, which makes sense as to why we felt so loved, because we're noisy. <laughs> Peter is quiet in nature, but when he was ready, he loved the excitement and the noise. He would as be in the background, smiling and observing, and then come drop his two cents in, and then come out. Peter enjoyed his drink of choice for many, many years was super tea, that blue can, and Ray and nephew. However, the last six months, he stopped drinking alcohol altogether. Even during his last holiday in Jamaica in May with mom, not a drop. And you know, Peter lived in England for so long Yet he's the only man I know that not a word of English come out in mouth. <laughs> in Patwa was strong. And you either understood him or you didn't. And if you didn't, sorry for you, because he's not a man to repeat himself. He only said things once, and that was it. Peter was so grateful for the life he had with us as a family. That man always greeted you with a smile. Everyone that came to our family home was treated as family and felt welcomed in his presence. And as a result, his presence was always welcomed. Anything Peter put his mind to, he would accomplish. Now I said, what Peter put his mind to, not what mum tried to put his mind to. He was so laid back. My uncle Mike, he said, in Jamaica, them call him donkia. <laughs> He had so much work as a welder, but he chose to be self-employed. He planned his jobs how he wanted them. He could fill his day, but he did one job a day. He ensured that he finished by lunchtime to make sure when he come back, we eat. He was a family man, and he never chose wealth as over family. His value did not come from material things. You know how much clothes me and De um, Kian, Kian, me and Hayden buy for him? And they're still in that wardrobe with them tags on. Hmm? Still there. 
He did. He wore what he wanted to wear. Him buy what him want to wear, and he liked what him like to wear. Can't tell big man what we put on. Mom, if it was a special occasion, she might get the privilege of picking a shirt. But that was as much as it was. And whilst he wasn't materialistic, he did like his cars. He always had the sports range cars before he exchanged them for his quality vans. And in Great Bar, he was known for his vans. He did have one red one, one white one, and a yellow one. He didn't know for the man with the yellow van. He would use his vans for work up and down the country. And previously, he would attend carnival, where he would have four or five drum pans and cook up a storm. Some jerk chicken and on a separate pan would have the pork. Him was the only one, the first one at carnival for sell out. The smell, the aroma, the love that he put into his food, why did we enjoy that? Peter was a loyal man. He was protective and he was a caring husband, father, son, brother, cousin and friend. He lived a good life and he was happy surrounded by his family and friends. The scripture says, I know that there is nothing better for people than to be happy and to do good while they live, that each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all their toil. This is the gift of God. Peter took this gift and made a legacy to be proud of. Many, many, many happy memories to treasure. We are all impacted by this loss. But the one thing I wanted to say today, that man always had a smile on his face, always had a smile on his face. So while we take the time to grieve today, I want you to smile. I want you to enjoy his celebration. This is what we come here for. He wasn't a man that liked tears. He wouldn't want to see you crying. He wants to see you happy. He wants to see you joyful. And he wants to see that smile on your face. So for the best that we can do, lift up your hearts, smile, and thank God that we got to experience such a wonderful man. Many people don't have the gift of Peter in their lives, but we did. And why did we love him? And why did we make him know that we loved him till the very end? So today, if you want to take away anything, you love on your family, you love on your friends, because we don't know how long we have on this earth, but we know that our impact after we're gone is immense. So love one of people, please, because Peter did, and we loved him just the same. Thank you. The tributes continue now uh, with songbirds sung by Ruth, Rebecca and Kyla.
we stand as we're able now as we sing the second hymn, Lord, I lift your name on me. Good afternoon everyone, just going to read a um, poem dedicated to my uncle, The Quiet Man. He is the one who, not, who begs to be known. We've all had the pleasure of knowing Joseph Peter Brown, the quiet achiever in his own quiet way, thinking more than he talks, he never has much to say. A family man, quiet and gentle soul, he would also keep his ego well under control. A good friend to have for those who have known him for a while and to help others who go that extra mile. The quiet man, he is happy in his life. He takes care of his children and his devoted wife. A passionate cook, for him it was effortless work. Happy with his beer, by the drum pan, marinating the jerk. A man who laughed hard at the same joke Tell he was no more. Just don't laugh at him. Come out the room and close the door. A quiet man in the background, neither without his smile. With his smile, sorry. We don't say goodbye. We say see you in a while.
Yeah, this is a tribute from our mother. It's not strong enough to be here, so it's better she stay in Jamaica. A mother's grief is like an ocean, deep and wide, and never ending. In, love, in loving memory of my son Peter, his life was a blessing, his memory is a treasure. He was loved beyond words and will be missed beyond measure. Peter may be gone from this earthly life, but he will remain in our heart forever. I wish you a peaceful, peaceful rest, Peter. Though you are gone, though you are no longer here, you will never be forgotten. Love from your mom. And his brother Neil says, may your soul rest in peace. All right, this is a tribute from me. I shall say good afternoon, everybody. Again, you're probably familiar with me by now. But if you don't know, my name is Michael, Peter's brother. I welcome you all for coming together to celebrate the short life of Joseph Clifford Brown, AKA Peter. I wasn't planning to do a speech or a tribute as I am rubbish at public speaking, you can tell. So please understand if I seem a little bit nervous. Before I say anything positive of Peter, I want you all to get a little insight into the cause of his death. I share the same feeling with you all, with you all. Who knows Peter? It doesn't seem real, does it? It does make sense, does it? And it's difficult to process. It may, it may not be the right time for this, however, I feel I have to say something because everyone is asking what had happened due to the fact that it's death happened so suddenly. I can promise you his death was not sudden, though it appears so. Peter had stomach pains and indigestion for around five years. Despite do, doing repeated blood works, no abnormality was found, but the pain persisted. He altered his diet so he could diagnose what caused these pains. He stopped eating red meat. He stopped using cooking oil. He stopped drinking alcohol. And he, and he used home remedies to try and eliminate the cause of these pains. He was only trying to be his own doctor, really, because his personal doctor wasn't doing enough to diagnose the problem. His GP finally referred him for a MRI scan, but this was only after he collapsed. The scan showed his liver was covered with cancer, and it spread to his kidneys. Now it became untreatable because it was that diagnosed soon enough. This made me very angry because the doctor that's supposed to look after his health let him down. And yes, it, it, from me, it's an attack at the health services. It's literally an attack. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a wake up call for all of us. Google your symptoms to get more information. Be forceful to the health professionals so you can get the diagnostic that's, that you need. That's for that. Looking at the bright side, what can I tell you about our brother? As, some as, as some, as some of you may know, Peter was raised in Jamaica from an early age. And as they say that in the eulogy, he's the second of five siblings. In general, Peter was a quiet man. I mean, a few words, except when we were on the phone chatting. He can chat for hours then. Yes, he was a quiet man, not like me, who chatted too much. Especially if you give me two rum. <laughs> I haven't drunk any rum yet, so I won't be too chatty. <laughs> yeah. Peter was a private man. He kept everything close to his chest. He was always very laid back. I have to be diplomatic to get something out of him. You know, you have to be a detective to get certain things out of him. You can ask him direct question. 
you will get an answer. You have to be diplomatic with him to, to, to learn something or, or hear something. He always laid back. In Jamaican slang, we call it don't care. Meaning, he don't care. That's what don't care really mean. You don't care. In fact, I should write this in, in Patwa because as you said earlier, I chat mostly Patwa. But it would be difficult, I find it difficult to read Patwa. I can chat it, but I can't read it. He was a man of peace. He caused no problem with anyone. If a person is problem problematic, he would walk away. Peter was different. If you ask him to do something for you, he would say yes, but he don't do it. <laughs> when you ask him, he would say, I forget. This happens all the time. Just don't care. <laughs> From time to time, we would visit each other. Not too often, chatting about pretty much everything. In Jamaican slang, we just say chatting about ass, dead, and cold fat. <laughs> I don't know everybody familiar with that term, but um, it's a term that we use as did that. In English term, we just say chat about any and everything. That's the proper English term for it. <laughs> we, 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 we say chat about ass, dead, and cold fat. That means anything you chat about. The topic that's always part of our conversation that is that we would talk at length of how difficult it was while we were growing up. We talked about hours and the phone reminiscing and every, everything during our childhood. By talking to him, I suppose we were unwittingly comforted each other, and I'm going to miss this. The last time Peter visited me was the day after he came back from Jamaica on the 24th of June. He brought me some goodies, and we sat and drank soup. Which he enjoyed, which he enjoyed, of course. Smee cooked it. <laughs> and shut it up about us, dead and cold fat. <laughs> Within three days in his company, Peter was admitted to hospital. A week later, he was transferred to a hospice. This was when reality struck, because I found out his condition was untreatable, caused by the lack of care and attention from the health service. I can, remember, I can remember bringing him soup. It was so heart-wrenching when he could not drink it. He, he was too ill. I brought Escovich fish and fried dumpling, mainly for higher seat because she was mostly by his bedside. I have him a piece of fish when I get there, but he didn't want it. Not long after Hyacinth was eating the fried dumpling and the fish, and the fish he said, I didn't tell him that I brought fire dumpling. <laughs> I said, no, I didn't, because I thought, you know, if it should be easier to eat. <laughs> I fell off, if, I, I fell off left it then, because he was going to eat something. So it was great stuff. I asked him offer him the dumpling, but he said, he will have it later. The following morning, he told Hyacinth he ate it. <laughs> He did not. <laughs> I have seen found it wrapped in tissue, <laughs> trying to hide it. Obviously, he wanted her to believe that, she, that he ate it. It was now clear that, you know, yeah, I could see that the end was near. And it was so clear that there was no going back for him. And his light was switched off. 3.40 on the 24th of July. That's exactly a month after I came back from Jamaica. Mm -hmm. Bless him. I will never forget him. And now you are gone, but not forgotten. May your soul rest in peace, and I will meet you on the other side. Thank you.
ask you to stand as you are able as we commend Peter to the mercy of God, our Maker and Redeemer. God, our Creator and Redeemer, by your power Christ conquered death and entered into glory. Confident of his victory and claiming his promises, we entrust Joseph Clifford Brown. Peter, to your mercy, in the name of Jesus our Lord, who died and is alive and reigns with you, now and forever. Amen. Amen. May God, in his infinite love and mercy, bring the whole church living and departed in the Lord Jesus to a joyful resurrection. Amen. The service now continues to strip these energy. Let's go. 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 Let's go.
I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where will my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. He who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time on and forevermore. We have entrusted Joseph Clifford Brown, Peter, to God's mercy. And we now commit his body to be to the ground, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. In sure and certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our frail bodies, that they may be conformed to his glorious body, who died, was buried, and rose again for us. To him be glory forever. Amen.
Because the focus in their service is all about the preaching, it's all about the word, um, rather than the altar at the back. And our focus is communion. Obviously, the preaching is important, and everything. That's how they elevate it. 
It all seemed to go as, as planned. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Hampstead, but I've just been given some Vernon's Hampstead as well. So oh, it's right. Kind of, yeah, uh, because I was thinking. Uh, I was in Erdington. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so how many parishes are you in charge of that? Well, currently, legally two, but um, I'll be an oversight minister shortly and that'll be four. But... Okay, okay. So do you know Emma in St. Barry Yes, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. She seems to be doing all right. She's doing well. Um, yeah. We hope to have uh, ministers meeting together regularly. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Mm. I, I do send you some emails uh, uh, regarding the minister's meetings once in a while. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You end up in a, when you move, you end up in a, even, you know, your circle, well, you know this, your circle widens and then there becomes only so many hours in the day. Yeah. 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 So I, I'm sure you're very busy. <laughs> There's only so many hours. But yeah. But 
the ministers um, in Edmonton still strong, so thank you. Yeah, so, uh, you know Gerard, um, yeah. from the Baptist Church, mm -hmm. and um, he, he's, he's really well, still, still uh, very active with the churches together. And Pastor Razak.
I'm sending a dove to heaven with a parcel on its wings. Be careful when you open it, it's full of beautiful things. Inside are a million kisses, wrapped up with a million hugs, to say how much we miss you and to send you all our love. We'll hold you close within our hearts and there you will remain to walk with us throughout our lives until we meet again. Ask if everybody wouldn't mind counting up with me now, please, okay? One, two, three. three. Oh Lord, support us all the day long of this troublous life until the shadows lengthen and the evening comes and the busy world is hushed and the fever of life is over and our work is done. Then Lord, in your mercy, grant us a safe lodging, a holy rest and peace at the last. Amen. Amen. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you and with those you love, both living and departed, this day and always. Amen.
Everybody. Everybody. Be holding you 